Okay, my name is Steve Mays from Soulwise, and what I'm going to do here is a quick video going through the setup screens, uh, GUI interface of the EAP 1300 product from Ingenious. Now, first of all, there are two versions of the 1300. The 1300 itself is an indoor uh, ceiling mount um, access point giving uh, 400 meg 2.4 gig 11N Wi Fi and 11AC Wave 2 on the 5 gig band up to 867 meg. Um, so I say it's a ceiling mount product or stroke wall mount product and it's PoE powered. Now, there are two versions of the 1300. There's this version here, which is the standard traditional um, ceiling mount ingenious product that you've all seen before. And there's also a sister product of it, which if I go back on our website and click on there, is exactly the same product, except fitted with four external antennas. So that's two 2.4 and two 5 gig 5 dB Omnis. Um, both products are intended for ceiling mount warm out. Um, the only difference between the two is, I say, the standard model of the AP1300 uh, uh, has the built-in 5 dB uh, dual band antennas inside, and the EXT model has these externally mounted 5 dB rubber duct type antennas. Um, I, no, I admit I'm not 100% sure where the two models fit in. I'm going to guess that the idea is that the standard version with the antennas built just into the front sends down a sort of wide cone shape of signal whereas the one with the uh, Omni antennas sends out a uh, wider broadcast horizontally orientated signal to give uh, further coverage, extended coverage. But I um, don't really know 100% exactly where the rationale comes in for the two models. Certainly having something like this stuck on your ceiling with these antennas stuck down like some horrible deformed spider stuck on the ceiling uh, doesn't sound very attractive in the average uh, average office or, or home environment. But hey, the two products are there. But as far as the web, web, set web setup is concerned, they're both exactly the same. So let's go look at the web setup. So the device should come on the default address 1.1. .1. I say should have uh, had some reports that the latest firmware version of these are coming out set on DHCP. So if one doesn't work, it may be because it's on DHCP. Either way, you just type in admin admin to get into the setup like that. No, I'm not going to bother saving that. So first stage, uh, first page just shows you the overall status. So you can see the country that's set up, obviously Netherlands by default. Uh, model numbers, IP settings, and the status for the um, ASSIDs plus guest SID for the 2.4, and the uh, ASSIDs plus guest SSID for the 5 gig, and the statistics for the LAN port throughput and the two Wi Fi interfaces. So let's go through the setup that you'd probably want to do first of all. So, first thing is probably want to go set the IP address so set it for DHCP or static uh, but just make sure you choose an IP address commensurate with your uh, with your network which isn't going to cause any clashes once you've done that the next stage is probably the wireless setup you want to go through uh, and the first thing on here is you probably want to change the country so uh, to be honest the whole of the EU is pretty much the same nowadays so it doesn't make a lot of difference um, but just for you know simplicity, let's change it to United Kingdom. It's warning us that channels may change if we do that. And uh, after we've done that, we've changed the country. If you go down here to channel configuration, here's where you actually set up the channels. Now, uh, there's a number of different channel options. 2.4 gig, you can actually select different bands by the default, it's set for all. And the 5 gig, you can either select all or specify specific channels that way. Let's just close that down because that's not really worth thinking about. Uh, now, the other thing you'll probably want to have a look at is the operational mode. Uh, so it supports access point, WDS access point or WDS bridge. 
in my feeling, considering the application, physical application for this product, you're probably only ever going to be interested in access point. Uh, so we'll go continue with access point here. You've got green mode ticked. Now, what green mode means is if ticked, it will tow the line as far as channel and RF power output is concerned, dependent upon the country. So uh, my advice is leave those as ticked. The only other thing you want to change is potentially the HT mode for the 5 gig. Uh, if you go for 80 meg, that will actually give you um, 11 AC operation. So it's probably worth ticking that. Um, or if you want a mixed environment, you can go to 40 meg. Um, so depends what your clients are and uh, what they're going to have they're going to be connecting. What else we got on here? Right, let's come down to the bottom. There we go. Now, each band supports eight SSIDs plus a guest SSID. Each SSID has complete settings for uh, isolation and security and VLAN tagging. By default, only the first SSID for each band is enabled. But to show you the features, let's go, let's go to the first one. So in here we have the settings that you can set up for an SSID. So full remit of various security options, um, access control filters, enable or disable based upon MAC address. And you've also got traffic shaping, traffic shaping, that's traffic shaping per SSID or per user. So got full traffic shaping capabilities there. Nice traffic shape in that. It's not quite, you usually don't quite see it that flexible. Okay, so that's that. Um, we'll save those settings. So they haven't actually changed anything. And yet again, you've got the same setup for the 5 gig. And then we come down to the guest network. Now the device supports a guest SSID on the 2.4 and or the 5 gig. Uh, by default they're disabled and the way it works is the guest network actually uh, operates as a Wi-Fi uh, routed network on the actual access point. So the access point is acting as a Wi-Fi router for the guests. Uh, as, when it operates as a router that means it's got very good isolation between the guest traffic and the public traffic. Um, so it's a nice way of doing it. So it means that if you've got a number of access points, each access point is own discrete guest Wi-Fi router so and you can do that on the 5 gig um, and or the 2.4 as I say and if I just look at the settings for the guest network 2.4 you can see what we've got so we've just got security you can set up and access control filter on the uh, settings as well on the uh, guest SSID as well turn that off not really interested in that and at the bottom we've got uh, RSSI threshold. So this is a minimum threshold for minimum permitted client signal strength. So what that basically means is if we were to enable this on the 2.4 at minus 90, it means if it gets a client with a signal worse than minus 90, what it will do is it will kick the client off. When doing so, it will obviously encourage the client to start looking for an access point elsewhere for it to connect to. So if you do use this function, just make sure you do have another access point for the client to connect to, or it'll have another look around and then come straight back and try to reconnect to this one. Up. So the client will just end up bouncing off, bouncing off, bouncing off and never get anywhere. Uh, the other issue you've got with RSI threshold settings is that this process of kicking the client off, sort of bumming the world, or uh, sorry, what's the expression? Um, arse in the breeze or whatever it is, arse in the wind. It does mean that any roaming capabilities for the client are actually uh, kiboshed. Uh, so what I mean is the client can be connected to an access point, busy partaking of various traffic sending, that sort of thing, and uh, or a VoIP call or any any sort of internet access, for example. And uh, the process of getting kicked, kicked off the access point means that obviously there is a significant break in that client's connectivity whilst it sorts itself out with another access point to connect to. So RSI threshold is to be used only where there's no other way of getting the clients to actually hop around. Now, um, in my opinion, it's better for the client to make the decision as to hop as to whether to be forced to do it by the access point. Uh, now, with some clients, that's easier said than done. 
Um, now with Android clients, you can actually uh, download a couple of very good and free apps which will uh, allow you to tune and uh, manipulate and configure the roaming aggressiveness of the client device. So that way you could actually put a setting in there such that the client will be uh, will tend more to try and find another access point to connect to. So that way the client is actually making the decision as to whether move or not, rather than being forced to do it by the access point, just dumping it out there. And uh, anything else we want to look at on this page? Not really. Oh yeah, band steering at the top here. We've got band steering. Uh, the way the band steering works is... Um, Obviously, 5 gig has a lot more bands available, a lot more channels available, and uh, as a consequence, less interference and higher client capability. So if you have clients that support 2.4 and 5 gig, it's actually preferable to try and get the 2.4 gig clients or those that can do 5 gig off the 2.4 and encourage them to go into the 5. So that's what band steering does. When a client tries to connect to 2.4, the access point interrogates the client, finds out if the client can do 5 gig. If it can, it'll try and coerce that client onto using 5 gig instead. And you've got various options there. You can try and uh, balance the clients across the two bands, force it to use 5 gig, or just strongly suggest that it uses 5 gig. So, uh, and obviously here we've got uh, an RSSI, basically what it won't do is it won't try and force the client over to the 5 gig unless it detects that it's actually getting a decent signal on the 5 gig band. Which is disabled for the time being. Let's go to the bottom, click on save. Okay. Now, if you've been observant, you would have noticed that this box up here called Changes has been going up. As I do these uh, configuration alterations on the system, this box, this number has been going up. Now, what that means is that um, each time I click on these buttons called Save, what happens is the configuration is saved into the access point, but it's not applied to the access point. Um, so what they're saying is there's 15 changes that have been backlogged now which haven't been applied to the device so when we're ready to actually proceed we've finished doing all the main changes we can click on this button here and it says well you've got all these changes to do wow 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 and you can click on apply and what we can do now is stand back for uh, about a minute and a half at a guess while it actually goes through each set of changes, applying them to the configuration. At the end of that, it'll uh, it'll restart, and those changes, those um, configuration changes that we've done, will have actually been applied to the actual operating parameters of the access point. So I'm afraid we do actually have a pause here while we uh, sit around waiting for it to apply the various changes. So it would be nice to have a little counter coming down, but hey, what the hell, it's not the end of the world, I suppose. But it does mean that um, whereas some access point products, every time you do a change, you have to go and apply, change, apply, change, apply, and it can make setting up a configuration a rather lengthy process. This process of actually storing all the changes up and applying in one go does mean that you can actually get the unit up and working much quicker without all those frustrating delays all the time as you go through the configuration. So what's it doing now? So it's giving you an indication here of the things that it's updating. Configuration applied. So that's it, we've restarted and now you can actually see that it says United Kingdom on here. And if I go and look at the wireless settings, uh, yeah, you can now see that everything's set in access point mode and it says UK up here and um, everything should be as per the settings that I want. I'm just checking to make sure everything is set up the way I want it to be. Yeah, that's all hunky-dory. It's all set up. Uh, that's it. So that goes through there. So uh, other features of the configuration, which we can have a quick look at, are um, 
we got advanced uh, now this product is actually supported to some extent by the neutron management solution so we can actually put the neutron uh, address uh, controller address in here if we want to uh, usual SNMP usual settings for command line and HTTPS uh, administration also it's got the capability to put an email address in and email server address in for uh, sending um, error uh, error emails and configuration change emails to what else we've got down here we've got uh, ability to alter and set the time on the unit uh, we've got a Wi-Fi scheduler uh, so on this page we can actually configure a periodic reboot uh, and also we've got a Wi-Fi scheduler which is probably more useful because with this we can actually do things for example to turn uh, specific SSIDs on and off at certain times of day so you may want to turn the Wi-Fi off in the evening or something like that so you can do that with this scheduler uh, tools usual stuff pings and speed tests and all that sort of thing um, username passwords for configuring and the usual screen for doing a backup and restore and also updating the firmware so that's the EAP 1300 I'll say that's also the EAP 1300 EXT because they're both exactly the same products barring the antenna configuration so you've got the same uh, configuration screens and the same GUI screens and that's the EAP 1300 Thank you very much.